And hello, everyone. It's nice to see so many well-known and well-loved faces as well. Um, it's very, uh, it's very nice and good and um, exciting for me to be allowed to present this project here. Um, and it's fitting in many ways because the original strands for it came out of me being at Woodbrook um, for a uh, retreat last year. Um, the basic shape of what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project, how it came about and what I've been doing. Um, then I'm going to read a selection of the project for you, showing you some illustrations so you have something to look at while I do. Um, and then we will have a little shuffle break, five minutes, where you can uh, stretch your legs or make a cup of tea. Um, and then we'll have some time where you can ask questions or share reflections right at the end. Um, last year when I was at Woodbrook, I'd already started um, asking questions of a lot of activists in different spaces about how they were feeling and how um, how they were doing, because I kept hearing people talking about burnout, losing hope, feeling worn down, um, challenged. And there was something about the the magnitude of it and the scope of it that that I couldn't quite like place a discomfort with. I understood there was something there, but I didn't really um, I couldn't really pinpoint what it was that made it so difficult to talk about. Um, one of the lovely people I was at this retreat uh, with was a um, elderly Quaker man who we had a long conversation where he said that he had never been depressed or struggled with um, mental health issues. But now, as of late, um, because people weren't listening to um, the warnings we get about the, the climate crisis and people weren't really taking in the seriousness, he said, it has made me feel quite depressed. And the way he said it and the way his wife reacted made me realize that this was a, a huge admittance for him. Like he was he was realizing and uh, admitting to something that for him was quite um, strange and foreign. Um but everyone around us kind of jumped on that and started talking, yeah, no, it's been really depressing. It's been really challenging. Um, one of them said, I, I feel like I just keep like needing to find all these new things to be angry about so I can keep going and keep going and keep going. And I kept thinking about this image of of finding things to be angry about to keep yourself going. And I just kept thinking about how that's inefficient fuel. Like that sounds like fuel that that you won't keep your fire burning in a good way um, and this image of the fire really started coming to me like ministry every every Sunday and every chance it, it just kept appearing and then the scholarship um, was sent to me as a suggestion and here we are I started doing some research I started looking into um, emotions and climate activism um, I'm going to share my screen and show you a little presentation. You should now see a presentation. Yeah, thumbs up. That's good. So it turns out that Climate activism is quite complicated right from the outset, because as many headlines told me very quickly, they are often fueled by negative emotion, like a lot of activism is. Um, but I also realized that there were a lot of people struggling with the language for this. Um, there's this uh, wonderful extract from a research paper called Towards a Taxonomy of Climate Emotions. Um, that says there is a growing evidence that emotions shape people's reactions to the climate crisis in profound but complex ways. Climate emotions are related to resilience, climate action, and psychological well-being and health. However, there is currently a lack of research about the array of various climate emotions. Um, and it really struck me as an odd thing, a, a, like a strangeness that we have this kind of type of activism or type of reaction that is so strong that we need like a separate taxonomy for the emotions of it um 
Climate anxiety as global study reveals three in four young people think the future is frightening. That was one of the early um, articles on climate anxiety. We also do research about what makes us spring into action. Anger is most powerful emotion by far for spurring climate action study finds. Um, this article spoke a lot about, also the study spoke a lot about how um, anger made it more likely that you would get into climate action than hope. But it didn't really talk about how you stay inside climate activism. Um, so I started doing what everyone in my generation does. I started rummaging around Reddit online to read what people were talking about. What were they asking for? Um, what were their thoughts to each other in these spaces that aren't academic at all, but just um, sharing spaces? Um, and this was a, a woman who's, who wrote a post that was headlined, How Do You Deal With Climate Despair? Um, and she wrote, sometimes living sustainably makes me feel happy, in control, peaceful. Other times the weight of the world and how far we have still to go feels crushing. I've been reading the good news, but I'm really despairing over the reality that life as we knew it is fading away. And even with all the good we've been doing, it's just not likely to recover. Um, and I've bolded a sentence or a part of a, a sentence there. And even with all the good we've been doing. Um, and this is a thought that I saw started repeating that there was this feeling that like we're doing all of these good things, but it never stops. It just keeps going. It It's still just unrelenting every day. And I thought, but is this new, really? Haven't we seen kind of shapes of this? Um one of the beautiful replies she got, which it makes me giggle, I don't know why, but she says, all I can think of to tell you is to keep fighting, keep that fire burning, help to spread the truth, to stump out misinformation, and don't give up or give in to your despair. I'm a two-time cancer survivor, and I never give up. Um, and I thought it's beautiful, but also kind of sad that like the, 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 I don't know, the, the kind of the gravitas behind telling you not to give up is that you're a two-time cancer survivor. Like this is this is grief, like big grief that we're dealing with. With They are the, the people with sort of the experience to tell us what we're, we're working with. But I kept asking, like, how is this different? Like, why is this activism, this climate crisis so difficult for us to talk about the emotions of in a... Um, in kind of a supportive way, like how do we talk about the hope and, and the, the resilience and how to, do we talk about like keeping going um, in such a different way when we've had so much activism in the past? There's so many situations where we had to work consistently over time to achieve very difficult and hard things. Um, and I got some suggestions. Uh, one of them is that we haven't really seen what like situations that that encompass so many where so many are affected um and at least not in recent years or in in recent history um and that made me think of this image which i'm sure you all know of ruby bridgers um one of the first the first um young black girls on a school that had been all white in louisiana she received death threats there were loads and loads of adult human beings standing there yelling harassment and abuse at her uh, as she entered and exited school um she turned 70 turned 70 later this year actually and um, this is her just a few years ago it is recent history and for her and her family and her neighbors and her neighborhoods and so many other people this was a huge and widespread and sort of life-threatening thing um Another suggestion that I got is because we haven't really like seen other big issues in recent times, which we know just kind of by evidence and, and things like um, Black Lives Matter in just a recent couple of years and Me Too and stuff like that isn't true. But also like Bitcoin was invented and launched in 2009 and in 2010 was the first time the European Court of Human Rights um, 
admitted or or confirmed that stable relationships of cohabitating same-sex couples fall within the notion of family life. So we've had Bitcoin longer than we've had the definition of same-sex couples as um, protected family life. Um, this couple um, were the first same-sex couple to get married in uh, England. Their 10-year anniversary hasn't happened yet. It is later this month. So recent history, current issues. Um, and I was fascinated by how many Quakers have been so active in activism, so active in activism for a long time in many of these courses and cases as very, very active and kind of enthusiastic and sacrificing allies. And that started triggering something for me, that this is a different situation exactly because we are, like there are no allies, we are all the affected. Um, which means that we have large groups of different uh, activisms who have experience being in the position of fighting for survival for your own and all of your children and might go generations back. But we also have large group of activists who are feeling the unrelenting force on it, of it on their body for the very first time. And that is a very difficult conversation to have because you very, very quickly end up in situations where some feel attacked or dismissed or overlooked um, and where the language we have around activism just doesn't give us the space we need to have these conversations in a productive way. Um, we end up falling into traps where we're saying, oh, but this is bigger, like this affects all of us. This is global and therefore it's so different that the lessons that you've learned in your activism don't apply to me. And although it is true that this is bigger and grander and harsher than anything we've seen, it is also still activism and it is still dependent on having hope. Um, I said earlier, there was this article, this uh, research project that said that um, anger made it far more likely that you would take climate action than hope. But um, it also has been several studies since then that confirmed that staying in activism, being an activist over time, um, making sustainable choices for activism is dependent on um, what they call informed hope, like knowing the reasons we can still feel hopeful. So this formed the background for what I wanted to do. I am a writer by trade. I translate, I write, I make things with words. And I am fascinated with how we can use metaphors to give ourselves these spaces to have these conversations without triggering challenges of language, which is all I think these, these problems are. Ways in which the way we use language is so different that even though we're talking about the same thing, we don't understand each other. So I made a collection of texts called Tending Flames. Um, there's 16 texts in total. Um, I'm going to read a handful of them to, uh, to you now. Um, some of them have many illustrations that will lead you by the hand through them as I read. Others only have one illustration for you to look at. Um, I will leave a couple of moments between each text so that you can let them land a little bit. Um, when I reach the final text, I will leave a few moments and then I will let you know when we gather again after our shuffle break so that um, we can kind of enter the shuffle break quietly and, and still reflecting if we want to. The selection of texts is not entirely random. I've chosen ones that are short enough that we can get through them in a good way. There's one that is a little longer, but most of them are quite short. Um, but they also... They give you an overview of what sort of things are in this collection and the kind of messages that I've been working on translating from lessons of activism into um, lessons about tending flames. The first text is called Tending the Flames. There are things we've always known about fire and there are things we've had to learn over time. We've always known that fire can be dangerous, but we've had to learn that it can also be kind. 
knowing how to tend the flames, how to feed them, fan them, keep them going, has been crucial to our survival for at least a million years. In short, we know a lot about fire. Activism is exhausting at the best of times. Standing up for what is right is difficult work, especially when what is right doesn't align with the way things have been, what is profitable, or what keeps the powerful in power. And rarely have we seen this as clearly as we do now during this ongoing global climate crisis. We watch our politicians sign climate pledges with one hand while reopening coal mines with the other. We repeat, reduce, reuse, recycle like an encouraging chant while every available surface seems plastered with the message, buy more, more often. Being a climate activist can feel like standing up to the sea, like trying to protect your sandcastle from the approaching storm. It can feel terrifying and ultimately hopeless. You may feel tired. You may be tempted to give up. You may feel drawn towards anger, hopelessness or despair. There may be questions ringing in the back of your mind, like how do I keep going when people aren't listening? Why am I making these sacrifices when no one else seems to care? Why should I commit when our politicians don't? Because it is right may be the answer, but over time it can start to feel like a sneer. You are not alone. We are not alone. There is a quiet cheer on the wind from all those who came before. We are not the first. We are not the first to race against the tides, not the first to be weak in the face of the powerful. We're not the first to march for our rights or the futures of our children. We're not the first to fight for survival. There are lessons to learn from those who came before us, those who had to march against the tides to change opinions, those who burned against the darkness to win us our freedoms and rights. And although this challenge feels inconceivably huge and threatening, there is hope. The climate crisis is not a force of nature. It is a monster of our own making. The powerful are not legends or gods. They are people. Capitalism is not an ocean. It's a habit. And the darkness is not complete. You are holding a torch. Like the activists who came before, we have to keep moving. We have to keep our fires burning and hold out for the dawn. We are resilient and we are strong. We have hope and there's still time. This is why we talk about burning, to remind us to tend the flames. You hold, you are, and you see the fire. You hold the fire. It's the candle you light in the window on a dark night. It's the match you strike against the darkness. It is the lantern you raise to raise to read the writing on the wall, and the torch you carry through the woods, the candle at the vigil, and the lamp you bring down the mines. You hold the fire. You are the fire. You are the campfires others gather around to warm their hands and feet, to share their stories. You are the passionate call among the murmurs, the spark that lights the flame in others, the excited flicker of new ideas, the patient flame of a guiding star, the harsh light that falls on secrets and lies. You see the fire. You see the fire in others and the dying flames. You see the sparks and flickers, the campfires and the stars. Take notice. You feel the fire. At the center, down where it's quiet and still. You feel the warmth and see the light that burns eternal. If you listen, you will hear it speak. 
You feel the fire when you seek it. And only you can name that still small voice. Ending the flame. If your house is heated by electricity or gas, or you grew up somewhere warm, wood-burning fires may hold a romantic spot in your mind. They may belong to images of roasting chestnuts, romantic getaways, or Christmas movies. I, however, grew up on a farm in Norway, and wood burners were our primary heat source in the colder months. And although the orange light of a flickering fire, the radiating heat and the crackling sound of crisp firewood are all distinctly cosy to me, they also remind me of the toil and effort of keeping a fire going. Days at home were punctuated by the sounds of the wood burner opening and closing, of logs being thrown into flames, tossed onto heaps of embers, or gently stacked over a weak glow of air vents being slid open or shut, more firewood being brought in from outside. And in the summer, there was lumbering and wood chopping, huge pallets of wood left to dry in preparation for winter. And all of this was in careful consideration of sustainable forestry, of course. Where could it be cut? Would it leave us with spruce or birch this year? A fire requires attention. It asks you to be aware of its needs and plan for them. It needs you to stay aware of its purpose. It needs to be fed at the right time and in the right way. It needs air, enough to keep burning, but not so much that it rages through the fuel. It needs to be contained so it doesn't grow destructive and wild, but not so contained that it suffocates and dies. Regardless of whether your fire is lit for heat, light, atmosphere or destruction, it still has needs of its own. The fire asks you to remember that its needs are yours. If you don't take care of the fire, it cannot take care of you. Feeding the flame. It may seem complicated to keep a fire burning, but it really is very simple. A fire only needs three things, fuel, oxygen, and heat. When someone tells me they feel like they're burning out, the first thought that springs to mind is always, how are you feeding your flame? We know that flames need to be fed, but we rarely pay attention to what we feed them. And perhaps more importantly, we don't think about why it matters. Some things burn quickly. They burn with a bright, hot flame and are gone in a matter of minutes. These things catch fire at the slightest spark, but flicker out just as quickly. It can be addictive, burning this kind of fuel. It's exciting to watch it flare and feel the intense heat of the flame. These flames can cut through metal and melt rocks into lava. This can be very useful, or this can be very destructive. Some things burn poorly, with weak flames and thick, dark smoke or noxious gases. It can be difficult to make these things burn at all. They're too wet, wet or need too much heat to get started. They may leave behind too much residue, making it harder and harder to keep burning over time. But these fuels are often cheap and readily available. They will keep you warm enough to survive and cost just enough light to see the next few steps in front of you. They will keep you going, at least for a while, but they're rarely good. Some things burn with steady warm flames and clean ashes. They cast light in a larger area and gives you enough heat to warm others. These fuels are very rarely exciting. They're rarely cheap. Often they're heavy 
and must be patiently gathered and gathered with intention. They often have to be sought out. They often have to be chosen. But they'll burn long and they'll burn well. Some of these fuels are good and sustainable. Others are not. They can be toxic and they can be harmful to you and others. Some are plentiful and others are only available to those who can afford them. Some fuels catch fire in a split second and bring the whole building down. They explode in fiery infernos and destroy everything in their path. The damage can linger or be quickly forgotten. Some things won't burn at all. They may have no effect on the fire whatsoever, or they may quell it, smother it, suffocate, drench or snuff out the flames. Sometimes forever. Sometimes for good. So what do we feed our fires? So very many things. Here are some. Violent passions, righteous indignation, anger, anxiety, entitlement, greed or lust. Guilt, fear, obligation, shame or irritation, resignation, discomfort, a desire for attention, a want to be seen doing the right thing. Hope, a sense of community. Kindness, excitement, a desire to be right, a sense of justice, courage, a desire for power, the wish to make a difference, the wish to leave a mark, the wish to help those who can't help themselves, the wish to help yourself, faith, passion or curiosity. Rage or desperation, apathy, depression, hopelessness, complacency. Conscious ignorance or cowardice. What do you burn? A light in a storm. There is a kind of storm that makes the heart feel small. The wind howls and the rain whips. Thick clouds darken the sky like a bruise. The creaking of trees threatening to fall. The clatter of debris tumbling through the air. A storm is a cacophonous being. A dangerous space. A creature of force and fear. You cannot fight a storm, but you can hold a light, hold it high, be a beacon showing the way back to shore, out of the woods, out of the rain. A storm is a scary place and the bravest thing you can do is be in it. Find shelter, seek refuge and tend to the flame. Place a candle in your window, in every window. Light the fire and put the kettle on. Be the refuge and the fire for those who shamble through the night, stumble through the woods. You cannot fight a storm, but you can hold light. The next text I wrote for myself as a reminder. Um, because it is sometimes really easy to look for people to blame, people to be angry with, people to um, judge or or kind of, I think blame is the best word, people to blame for what is happening and what is going on, um, partially because it makes it easier to feel there's a direction, but also because if there are people who are the problem, um, then it's not your fault if things don't change, it's theirs. So the next text, oops, is called They Are Not the Darkness. It might seem almost impossible to believe, but they are not the darkness. 
their power and influence, their harsh words and condescending tones, their constant fight for injustice, it's easy to mistake them for the dark. But they are not the darkness, they are in it. They don't create the darkness, it entangles them. As they move, it moves. As they spread, it spreads. As they speak, it speaks. But without them, it is weak. Blinded by darkness, they build their monsters and dig our graves. They dance around their shrines and mumble, more please, more. They read the world around them in the ghost light of their own lies. But they are not the darkness. And this is key. Because you fight monsters with swords and crossbows and anger. But darkness is just an absence. And we are on our way. Those who cling to darkness. There are those who will never listen or understand. Their eyes have grown so used to the darkness and they see light as nothing but a terrible threat. When your light temporarily blinds them, they will accuse you of manipulation or of masking the truth or of diverting attention from the beautiful nuances of night, of being part of some great conspiracy or having fallen victim to it you will not win them over. There are those who will never care. The darkness grants them too much power and the devastating consequences of inaction will reach everyone else before it reaches them. They will belittle you, claim the matter too complicated for you to understand. They are experts in pointing fingers and deflecting blame. They nurture themselves and the, on the ignorance of others you will not win them over. But most of those who cling to darkness are there because we failed them. We failed them when they were younger or when they grew older or when they called out for help. They distrust everything we say because so much of what we claim possible has never been possible to them. They distrust authorities because authorities have spent so much energy proving themselves untrustworthy. They distrust scientists because our schools didn't meet them where they needed to be met. They are angry because we are asking them to give up what they've been fighting all their lives to gain. They are angry because we're asking them to give up the only power and privilege that benefits them. We are asking them to give up a hope in a dream that we've collectively spent decades convincing them to follow. And to them, you say you're sorry. You listen to their anger and try to understand where they're coming from. You let them rage against the injustice of it all and present their strange hypotheses. And you do not laugh and you do not scorn. You do not lecture or mock or roll your eyes. You do not point out the injustices done to others or how privileged they really are or how their altars to the darkness look a lot like false gods. Instead, you listen patiently, and then you ask questions. You ask open questions that will ring out in the caverns inside them and stir up answers from within. Questions to which you don't know the answers. Not clever questions, not carefully crafted questions, just honest questions that sink through the murky waters and create ripples on the surface without posing any threat. You do not dim your light. You keep the fire burning. You meet their eyes and you smile and you patiently listen for the light inside them and you let your light answer its call.
being an artist with ADHD, I have not decided on a title for this next text. So it is for all eternity called There is More to Do, brackets, the campfire. Climb the barricades, tear down the fences, dismantle the forces and stand up against injustice. Spread the message, be loud, be proud, be fearless and cunning and brave and persistent and march. Arrange a candlelight vigil and a protest and an exhibition. Chain yourself to a tree or to your friends and be in the way. Disrupt, break it down, cause a commotion and find alternatives. Stay calm, speak with a clear voice, give them reasons, show them what we can do, what you can do, and don't lose hope. Shout. Do everything, do all of this, or don't. There is more to do. Someone has to light the campfire. Make spaces where others can come back to lick their wounds. Someone has to serve the teas, make the coffees and put the kettle on. Someone has to keep the campfire burning. Someone has to share our stories, pass them on, bring them forward. Tell us the stories of those who came before. Someone has to light the campfire. Open the floor for discussion and make sure we're all heard. Keep an eye on the leaders, keep an eye on the children. Welcome newcomers with open arms and without judgment. Someone has to offer comfort, offer clarity, keep the fires from running wild. Stepping out of the darkness is a terrifying thing. To see yourself in the light for the first time and see what you have done, see what you have built or what you didn't do. Someone has to light a campfire. Invite those stepping out of the darkness to have a seat. Make a space where they can sit and quietly stare into the flames. Somewhere they won't have to meet anyone's eye. Not yet. Not before they're ready. Somewhere they can have a blanket placed around their shoulders and a mug pressed into their hands. We need the loud disruptors and the barricade builders, and the wall jumpers, and the medics, and the quartermasters, and the navigators, and the travelling bards. And we need someone to light a campfire, and to meet us there. You didn't start the fire. My grandfather, he thought me a song. And it was a song that we sang after Christmas dinner in my family and still do. It has always been clear to me that this song is important. My great grandmother brought this song to my great grandfather's farm when they married in 1907. And we know that her mother had grown up singing it too. We don't know how long it has been sung in my family, but we suspect it's been sung for a very long time. The first translation of the song appeared in Norwegian in 1569. And despite there being later translations that are much more common and much more widespread, and there being a later melody that is all but established as the melody at this point, it is this first translation of the song, or a version of it, that has made its way down to me. As a child, I felt the song was like an heirloom. It was something valuable and precious that I mean passed from hand to hand down the ancestral line, something that had to be protected at all costs. And I railed against these others more established versions of the song. I felt they sullied the purity of our song, cheap replicas of a true masterpiece. When other people told me that they too had a version of the song traveling down their family line, I would silently doubt the validity of their versions. Had it traveled as long as ours? As purely as ours? Had they really sung it every Christmas? Like many children, 
I assumed my experiences were unique and superior. The way my beautiful grandfather's thunderous voice had carried the song all these years, that surely had to be better than what some stranger's wobbly-voiced grandmother had managed to do. Of course, I grew out of this way of thinking, but to my discredit, I stopped thinking very much about it at all. When my grandfather died, he was a hundred years old. He died right before Christmas, and out of nowhere, I suddenly felt the song was a burden, a responsibility. This flame that had been passed from generation to generation, but as soon as my grandfather's flame flickered out, I suddenly got scared. What if we didn't make sure the next generation's candles were lit? Then the song itself could die. How could we make sure the song remained true? And what if we messed it up? What if we corrupted it somehow? Now, of course, I shouldn't have worried because we sort of already had. When a song is only sung once a year, it is bound to transform over time. For years, we had occasionally discussion, occasional discussions about some of the words, and we knew they were a little different, updated and slightly altered from the ones in my grandfather's old hymnal. We sang the song on Christmas Eve the year my grandfather died, and we sang it again a few days later at his funeral. That's when we learned that some of my grandfather's 11 siblings had continued the tradition too. They had sung the song with their children, who had sung it with their children, and now we were a mighty choir singing this simple song. We were one choir and one big family, but we were also several individual families singing side by side. The words were not exactly the same from family to family, and the tune had been shifted up or down here and there. Over time, the flame had grown and changed, but it had kept moving. Each of us was carrying the flame. We weren't the custodians of some unique heirloom, but bearers of a flame that was lit in a thousand other families in a thousand different ways. And there was comfort in that. Although many had blown out their candles or chosen different paths, there were still more people singing in that room than there had been around my grandfather's childhood Christmas table. The song would keep moving as long as some of us kept passing it on. I sometimes think of that song when I see young or new activists shaking under the responsibility of saving the world. When the severity of the planet's situation dawns on them, they might clutch their candle until their knuckles whiten, terrified that they will be the one who drops it after all this time. Like me, they may be scared to death that they'll somehow corrupt it, change it, get it wrong. And no wonder. If you think you're holding the only flame, the one true burning flame. Sitting down to take a break feels impossible. Because what if a storm rolls in? What if night falls? What if you fall asleep and drop the candle? When you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders, I invite you to look up. You didn't start the fire. It has been carried for a long time, generation after generation. Sometimes it has been weakened, sometimes strengthened, but it has made its way far, far, and now we're many. Your flame is important, maybe even crucial, but your flame is not the fire. For older activists too, it can be frustrating to see new activists fight in unfamiliar ways. Sometimes they change the wording of the narrative that you have fought so hard to push, or they'll turn focus away from your preferred cause, suggesting that a different focus matters more, is more urgent. It may feel like they don't value your contribution, like they don't understand how much it took to get here. They roll their eyes at your exhaustion and carry on as if you didn't just lead the march. Look up. Look behind you. Look at the long train of flames slowly marching towards a common goal. The train stretches back through time and forward through the darkness, and it links us all together in the hope for a better day. Your flame is important, maybe even crucial, but your flame is not the fire. Change might happen fast or slow, and it might not happen soon enough, but the flame will keep moving as long as we keep passing it on. The fire will keep burning as long as someone carries the flame.
embers. Once upon a time, an ember was a very valuable thing. Just as much as it was evidence of a dying fire, it was the promise of new flames. Because embers save time. To light a fire from embers is relatively easy. Easier than lighting a fire by striking flint against steel or rubbing wood against wood. Embers can handle more moisture, more wind, more of everything than sparks can. Embers let you carry the fire with you. Yesterday's fire grows new flames today. More than 5,000 years ago, a man that we now call Utzi set out on a journey across the Alps. He died and lay frozen for thousands of years before he was found. But we know now that as he travelled across the mountains, he carried a birch pouch dedicated to fire. It contained dried mushrooms of a kind that burns well, iron pyrite for sparks, and two embers wrapped in maple leaves, remnants of a previous fire. We know that Vikings boiled a particular kind of fungi in urine for several days. Afterwards, they would beat it flat and make it flexible, creating a material that would smolder but not burn. This way, they could carry their scalding hot coals, bring fire from home with them on their journeys. The Piegan branch of the Blackfeet carried embers inside buffalo horns. The beast they roasted on the fire provided the tools to carry the fire forward. And we throw water on our campfire before we leave it, as we know there might still be embers under the ashes. They might still smolder and glow. Sometimes you cannot keep burning. Perhaps you run out of fuel, or the night is too long, or you simply can't stand it anymore. Then you can stop. Take a breath. Don't let yourself burn out. The flames are not the fire. Keep your embers safe. They need air, but not too much. You can wrap them in insulation and walk until you're ready. You can cover them in ashes until morning comes. Then you blow on them gently and feed them dry kindling, and your fire can burn again. Rummage around in your mind until you find the fire pot you inherited from those who came before you. Make yourself a fire pouch of perseverance and loving kindness. Keep your embers safe. Now, as much as then, an ember is a very valuable thing. Just as much as it is evidence of a dying fire, it is the promise of new flames. Of course, this isn't everything. Of course, it's not enough. We cannot save the world with only words or flames or fire. We keep the fire burning, tend the flames and feed them well. Shield them from the wind and rain. Keep your embers, trust the flame. Of course, this isn't everything. There's work and work and work to do. And yes, the night is long. And yes, the dark is deep. And yes, the creatures stalking us have long and deadly teeth. And no, we may not win. And yes, all may be lost. But every day we carry on. We must, we must, we must. <laughs>